Hello and welcome back to the seventh instalment of my Failed Franchises series. In this series, I look at failed rail franchises, whether this be their contract being stripped from them or their franchise simply being deemed poor by the public and industry. In today's video, we are looking at the most recent example of a train operating company's contract being stripped from them, Southeastern. We'll look at how they lost their franchise and other reasons Southeastern can be classed as a failed franchise. We go back to 2003, where the Strategic Rail Authority announced that Danish State Railways and Stagecoach, First Group, Govia and MTR slash C containers had all been shortlisted to bid for the former South Eastern franchise, renamed the Integrated Kent franchise, which would also include services to St Pancras along the new HS1 line. In November 2005, the Department for Transport announced that Govia had won the contract to run the new Kent franchise taking over from the publicly owned South Eastern Trains Company on April 1st, 2006, with High Speed One services expected to start from 2007. The franchise will also include £76 million being invested in station facilities, two new depots constructed, average on-time performance rating being at least 91.6% by March 2010, increase in service frequency and services to Dover being introduced. Southeastern, Govia, originally ran services from London, Victorian, Charing Cross, Cannon Street and Blackfriars through South East London to locations such as Bromley, Hayes, Orpington, Hastings, Maidstone, Ashford, Dover, Folkestone, Canterbury, Ramsgate, Sheerness, Gillingham, Strood and Dartford. Before HS1, South Eastern was purely a commuter slash regional service, with services being operated by fully electric units. The commuter class 508s, withdrawn in 2008, the class 465s, class 466s and 376s mostly operated local services out of London, with the class 375s and later class 377s operating the more regional services into Kent itself. Although HS1 was eventually delayed until 2009, South Eastern was still able to increase services on its routes. In December 2007, South Eastern announced an increase in its services, an increase of peak services out of Charing Cross and Cannon Street, as well as extra frequency on services from Beckenham Junction and Orpington to London Victoria, as well as other metro route frequency increases. Saturday services also increased, so they mostly mirrored the Monday to Friday off-peak pattern. Overall, quite a large service increase that pleased passengers. As well as this, although two years later than planned, on the 14th of December 2009, the first South Eastern HS1 service ran, the 0514 Ashford to St Pancras service, arriving at 0541, operated by the brand new Class 395 Javelin trains, reaching up to 140 miles an hour. This was a huge day for South Eastern. Not only does South Eastern now run the fastest services of any TOC in the UK, excluding Eurostar, but they now operated intercity services providing 200 extra trains in Kent each day and increasing capacity on the network by 5%. Journey times from Dover to London now took just over an hour from two hours previously. Although passengers had to pay more for the service, Gordon Brown claimed it was a great day for Britain, with Charles Horton, South Eastern's managing director, claiming it marked the most important day in their franchise. Whilst the new HS1 service took all the headlines, South Eastern's December 2009 timetable, for some, was not an upgrade and actually slowed journey times. Services from West Malling along the Maidstone line no longer went into London, with the only direct London service being a slow service into Victoria rather than Cannon or Charing Cross. The extra half hour that it took to get to London meant commuters would have less free time and less time to see family. One commuter said it ended her quick, easy, fast journey to London, and another said he was so fed up he was moving to another town with better rail connections to London. South Eastern blamed the Department for Transport, who had actually instructed South Eastern to remove the service as it didn't fit in with legal obligations the company had to meet regarding timetables. So although the change meant many passengers benefited from a growth in service, in 2009 some had to face a slower and more crowded commute. By 2010 though, it was clear that High Speed 1 and the Class 395s were a huge success. The service had made over 7 million journeys in a year and attracted 1 million new rail passengers, 
That meant 16% of passengers who used HS1 had never used the service before, with 1,800 stations across the UK having tickets purchased that used HS1, equivalent to 70% of all UK stations. Ashford, Broadstairs, Canterbury, Dover, Folkestone and Ramsgate were the most used stations for high speed. Charles Horton said he was pleased with the growth and said that 95% of customers thought that the service was good or very good. South Eastern, for the high speed services anyway, were doing rather well. However, just months later, people were calling for the South Eastern franchise to be stripped. Poor weather had led to huge disruption and an emergency timetable had to be introduced due to the third rail infrastructure that the South Eastern mainline used. Freezing weather meant that the third rail conductor had frozen across the network and led to many cancellations. South Eastern didn't convey information to passengers in a fashionable manner, with the Liberal Democrat London Assembly Group leader Caroline Pigeon writing to South Eastern to suggest that Govia should be stripped of their franchise. Some passengers believed that these cancellations would somewhat benefit them, if the firm ended the year below an 82% service running on time rate, then South Eastern would have been forced to reduce season ticket costs for next year by 5%, helping up to 120,000 people. However, despite only 5% of South Eastern trains arriving on time during the disruption, they conveniently ended the year on 82.04% of services being on time, above the 82% required threshold. This is despite some passengers having to spend the whole night on a train which broke down from London to Hastings. MP for Bexhill and Battle said the figures didn't smell right. Some passengers suggested that South Eastern had cancelled some services on purpose to meet the punctuality threshold as cancellations didn't count as being delayed. However, South Eastern declined this, suggesting weather cancellations were only made when instructed to be by Network Rail. The company also said that all punctuality statistics were processed independently, suggesting the figures were legitimate, however awfully suspicious. A BBC South East investigation found that HS1 services had bumped up the punctuality score to above 82%. To South Eastern's credit, they did introduce a new compensation scheme in 2011 to directly combat last year's fiasco. Now passengers will be able to claim per delayed train, if the train was over 30 minutes delayed. Managing Director Charles Horton said it was much fairer as all passengers could claim compensation, regardless of whether they were a season ticket holder or not, or whether their train was delayed or cancelled. Just months later, South Eastern were called out as the worst train company in the UK by a witch survey. Passengers rated the company poorly for its overcrowding and high fares, but many praised the high speed service they provided. However, this wasn't enough to stop them getting just a 40% customer satisfaction score, finishing bottom of the pile. South Eastern came back on the survey, highlighting how they carried 570,000 passengers per weekday, with 80% of those being commuters. The company slandered the survey for only being based on 300 South Eastern travellers, only 80 of those commuters. However, South Eastern gained praise for 2012 for their handling of running high-speed shuttle services between London St Pancras and Stratford International for the 2012 Olympics. The service was branded as the Javelin, which is where the nickname for the Class 395s come from. High Speed 1 on the Stratford Shuttle was a huge part of the London 2012 bid, and South Eastern had to ensure that they were ready to convey 25,000 passengers an hour to Stratford. Services ran from London St Pancras to Epsfleet at 8 trains an hour, with up to 12 trains per hour between the two at the busiest times in the evenings. Overall, the shuttle was a huge success, albeit very busy and helped create one of the most memorable and significant events in British history, transforming Stratford as an area and transforming travel in London. In December 2011, South Eastern cancelled 17 services on one weekend due to a voter mistake, where South Eastern didn't have enough drivers for their trains. Although the cancellations made up just 2.5% of all services across the weekend, high-speed services out of London St Pancras were quite heavily affected. In 2014, following steady progress on the franchise, South Eastern were given a four-year extension to their contract until 2018. Go Ahead promised huge upgrades to journeys, with £70 million being promised for investment in the services. The franchise would include 95,000 extra seats across the network and the introduction of smart cards. Rail Minister Miss Perry said she believed that the contract would provide passengers with the best service. Many improvements were promised, including an extra high-speed service per hour via Ramsgate and Ashford, high-speed services calling at extra stations, 
more Peak Express services, new services between Maidstone and Blackfriars, as well as Sheerness and London Victoria. South Eastern would also roll Oyster acceptance as far as Dartford and Swanley, and Oyster acceptance on HS1 services to Stratford. The company also promised to invest in new PIS information screens at stations. A large part of the franchise was also the refurbishment of the Class 465 and 466s, as well as the Class 375s, which included the addition of PRM-specified toilets. Finally, the company promised more ticket machines and longer opening times at stations. Passengers were wary, however, as South Eastern still had low satisfaction levels. This was proved in 2015 when another witch survey was released. This time, South Eastern had gone from bottom to second bottom behind the new Govia Thameslink company. South Eastern now had a 43% satisfaction rating, but achieved a 2 out of 5 or 3 out of 5 ratings across the six survey categories, which included reliability, value for money, cleanliness, and punctuality. The fact in three years that they had barely improved, passenger wise, was not at all positive although South Eastern did manage to achieve much of their promises on the new franchise. Under a year later though, in 2016, another survey saw South Eastern have just a 46% customer satisfaction rate, joint worse with Thameslink and Great Northern. 7,000 travellers suggested overcrowding, poor value for money and dirty trains were among the main concerns raised. Just 30% of passengers thought that the service was good value for money whilst just 29% were satisfied with South Eastern's delay compensation handling. South Eastern, this time, suggested upgrade works at London Bridge had caused huge disruption. Although this was partially true, because London Bridge was getting a huge upgrade, it only affected services to Charing Cross and Cannon Street, not Victoria, and there were different timetables during this engineering work. Nevertheless, South Eastern, and especially Govia, were under pressure to deliver. One of Govia's other train operating companies, GTR Southern, were performing dreadfully, with South Eastern entangled in poor performance controversy. Things got so bad that London Mayor Sadiq Khan also, in 2016, wanted to take control of the suburban Southern, South Eastern and South West train services to integrate them into the TFL overground network, or something similar. Sadiq Khan suggested the move would decrease cancellations and delays, with overground services usually being highly reliable. He also suggested that the move could create more jobs and would somehow help to build 80,000 extra homes. For good or bad, the government firmly rejected these attempts in December 2016, with Transport Secretary Chris Grayling implying that the changeover would just be deck chair moving for TfL to increase its profits. In fairness to TfL, their overground services are much more reliable than other operators, but they operate on a smaller and much more self-contained route, with much more funding than most other lines. In 2017, the Department for Transport announced some proactive benefits for South Eastern, not just rumours. The DFT would boost capacity on South Eastern, providing space for 40,000 more passengers and Wi-Fi on all trains by 2022. Remember, this was pre-Covid. This promise came with the next bidding for the South Eastern franchise from 2018. The next franchise would also see all first class seats removed to boost capacity, longer trains and replacements of older stock, new smart ticketing systems, as well as pay-as-you-go pilot schemes, and finally improved customer service. Although Abellio slash East Japan Railway slash Mitsi, Govia, Stagecoach slash Alstom and Trenitalia all bid for the next franchise, the government deliberated longer than expected meaning that the DFT gave South Eastern a short-term extension until mid-2019. Before the end of South Eastern's contract, the company got put in hot water after a staff member told an injured cyclist who wanted to buy a ticket and get some medical assistance to get out of this effing station. Although there was no clear reason why the cyclist was insulted, perhaps there was more to it than it seems, the story made it to several national tabloids, with South Eastern apologising. However, it definitely didn't look good for the company, and its potential future bidding process. Returning to South Eastern's contract, by 2019, the Department for Transport had decided to cancel the franchise competition, meaning Govia would automatically have a further extension until 2020, and then until October 2021, with the Department for Transport suggesting that having a new franchise would be harmful to the taxpayer, ironic with how South Eastern eventually got stripped. Regardless, the extension was not well received, as it meant the upgrades previously mentioned were not a guarantee, and it seemed as though the government were directly managing the railways, removing any supposed benefits of privatisation, 
whilst not allowing the benefits of nationalisation. A terrible mix between the two. Just before we look at the last few years of South Eastern, do consider liking, subscribing, checking out my full series, and joining slash donating to the channel if you are enjoying this video. A huge thank you to my first class member, Mia Jane, my business zone member, Anthony Harris, and my other members, Callum martin Bell, Danny, Deva Rooney, Ewan R, Gordon Walker, Jack's Railway Secrets, JMSF, Louis Donnellan, the Northern Irish Explorer, Shatterfox, Thomas Thorpe, and my donators, Clive's Travel and Trains, Deva Rooney, again, G Patterson, and Swansea Valley Bus Spotter. Thank you so much. Any donations and memberships go towards me making my videos even better and doing something I absolutely love, so thank you. Let's get on to the demise of South Eastern. After this extension, Covid happened. Of course, this hindered any prospects of capacity increases, as there was little income and little demand. In 2021, with passenger numbers rising, South Eastern confirmed its intention to inherit all of South Western Trains' Class 707s, to replace some of its ageing Class 465 slash 466s. On the 27th of September 2021, the first Class 707 entered service with South Eastern, branded as City Beams. As of 2024, just two Class 707s remain with South Western Trains, due to the slow introduction of the Class 701s, with the remaining 28 707s joining South Eastern. However, back to 2021. As literally the day after the first 707s entered service with the firm, they had their contracts stripped from them. It was confirmed that Govia had undeclared more than £25 million of taxpayer money, which should have been returned to the taxpayers via the Department of Transport, with then Transport Secretary Grant Shapps saying it was a serious breach of the franchise's good faith obligation. Govia said that they acknowledged the errors and apologised, with Shapps saying that Govia had broken the trust of the government. The government confirmed this suspected fraud would mean that South Eastern would be stripped of their franchise by October. On the 17th of October, South Eastern was taken over by the government-ran South East Trains Limited on an operator of last resort basis. With that, 15 years of Govia ran South Eastern Trains was over, with the new operator of last resort not being too different to its predecessor. I've been on both operators, under Govia and under the current government-ran operator, and... Both were okay when I went on them, but obviously both have their issues. And of course, Govia Southeastern had quite a few issues. Regardless, Govia Southeastern did improve some aspects of rail travel in Kent. The introduction of HS1 services was huge for Kent, and the refurbishment of all stock also proved popular, as well as service increases on local services throughout Kent. However, poor value for money, customer service, cleanliness and punctuality severely hindered the company with fraud eventually being the nail in the coffin for Govia. So, would you say South Eastern was a failed franchise? Personally, I would, yes. Any franchise that's been stripped from them clearly has failed in some way, even if it's not in performance or in something passengers can see. Let me know what your thoughts are on South East in the comments below. And if you did enjoy this video, do consider liking, subscribing, and perhaps even joining the channel. Thanks ever so much for watching. Check out the full Failed Franchises playlist in the description, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.